Okay. Is the PPT visible, visible to you? No, sir. No, sir. No. Now it's visible. Yes, sir. Okay. So today we will discuss about how you can <clears throat> build a small size embedded systems using a microcontrollers. That's we will start the journey from today. So we will cover them. What are the basics required? to build a small size embedded system using a microcontroller. Till now we have understood, given the microcontroller, how do we identify the CPU core used inside a microcontroller? And once we identify the CPU core inside the microcontroller, we have studied inside the core what is present. We understood inside the core, it presents the registers, the ALU, the program counter, stack pointer, control register, so many things. And what is the work of each of these blocks inside the core and how they are put together to execute the different types of instructions which has been designed for that core by the manufacturer. We have also written few programs how to use a core and effectively implement different algorithms. Now, having understood the core, so from today onwards, we'll start our journey to use the core to build a controller and use that controller to realize the products. And when I say products, it's nothing but embedded products, actually. So we will combine the unit four and five and also some basics about embedded systems, which is which was there in the unit two. So in the few classes from today onwards, and as we understand these topics from next week onwards, we also do some programs about particular about the microcontrollers, how the pins are used, how do we use the pins to build a small size product. So let's start our journey about the embedded systems. Till now we were focusing only on core and the ALP. So now our focus about embedded system is mainly on ARM microcontrollers. Using the ARM core, we are designing our systems. So before we start learn about the ARM core, so let's understand some of the fundamentals about the embedded systems before we go into the building the products basically. Every day, every moment, if you turn around in your life, if you turn around and see the different, the devices or gadgets around you in your house, in the workplace, in the place where you visit, in the shops, malls, there are a number of products are there which are very small, look small, and which cost also less many times, and which consumes less power and which operates many times by a battery. And sometimes you, when you visit the hospitals, you can find a bigger systems, which are bigger than the computers, but which serves a particular application. So embedded systems range from a very small size like your uh, uh, a small watch to a small city, it's a small watch to a very large machine like a city scanner. So it vary in sizes, it vary in the complexity also. If somebody has given an example for an embedded system, the number of examples you can give starting from the watch to the city scanner, anything which is not a general purpose computer, anything which is meant to work for, a, for satisfying a specific task, Anything which is being designed to perform a particular application, specific application, whose task has been defined at the time of manufacturing itself, you can call them as an embedded systems. <coughs> I'm audible. Yes, sir. So now let's see the certain applications. How do we classify embedded systems? What are the requirements or the characteristics of an embedded systems? is they have used inside the microprocessor controller, how embedded system is different from a general purpose computing systems. We will learn all those characteristics. 
Now, this is an embedded system which has been put in a washing machine. So left side, you can see an embedded system which has been associated, which has been associated with your uh, uh, air conditioner. So generally any embedded system, there's a typical interface will be given, unlike your computers, where the interface is always the voice. So now you're talking to the voice through a set of icons, clicking on the icons. But as an embedded system, the, the interface is application specific. For example, what you see on the washing machine interface, the, the names and the, the meanings are not found when you see the same thing on your uh, uh, air conditioner uh, controller that is a handheld, whatever you use to control your air conditioner. They're different because all the interfaces are application specific, unlike a computer where uh, any for any application you use a computer, the interface will be similar. Only thing is you click on a particular icon, you start using them. So let's learn about now what is a microcontroller and what is a microprocessor? First, basic things. If you take any system, computing system, whether general purpose computer, laptop, or embedded system, basically the one which is intelligent device, which makes the system intelligent, is nothing but the microprocessor or the microcontroller. So these are one of them are used in building intelligent systems. So let's understand the difference between the microprocessor and the microcontroller. If you take microcontroller, if you take the microprocessor, the microprocessor will have a CPU core, the all, and all other things, that is a memory, the ports, the timers and the ports, other things for communication are being outside the core. That means this is a different part and this is a different part. So the whole thing they put in a boat, they call this as a mother boat. So that means that it occupies the more space, the more power, the more investment you have to go through that one. If you take a microcontroller, the typical example is given here, a microcontroller of 8051. So 8051 was a very popular microcontroller, the first popular microcontroller from the Intel microcontrollers. It has ruled the market. Many of the earlier embedded systems, starting from a calculator, they were developed using 8051 core microcontrollers. Even today, 8051 microcontrollers are used in many of the legacy products. So this is the architecture of Intel 8051 microcontroller, which was used extensively in the- Sir, so we can't see the slide of uh, architecture. Okay. Okay, now you can see? Yes, sir. How come it has not moved? See that now is it moving? Could you able to see the next slide? Sir, Thank it's you. not the slideshow. Uh, the PPT itself is visible. Okay. The slideshow is not visible. Now is the slideshow is visible? Yes, sir. Hmm? Is it moving? Yes, sir. It, yeah. So we were discussing about this. You could see this. We were discussed. Hope. Huh? Okay. Okay. I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So I was discussing about any intelligent system, you take it. It is basically designed using an intelligent block inside that intelligent systems. What is that intelligent block? Either it will be a microprocessor we call, or it will be a microcontroller. Any microprocessor based system, basically the microprocessor, when I say the word microprocessor, will have one chip. It has been only the CPU will be there inside. That CPU core, what we were talking, it's only that is present inside a single chip. So when you design a microprocessor-based system, the memory is outside, the, the ports, timers, and the ports the, for communication, everything is outside. So generally what we do, we put all these chips inside one board, and we call it a motherboard. So in microprocessor-based systems, the CPU core does not contain the memory and the ports and the timers. They are present outside. So the whole system is considered as a one board we use inside a computer. But if you look at the microcontrollers, so there's nothing but microcontroller as the name says that unlike the microprocessor based system, the CPU, the memory 
and the ports and timers are present inside a single chip, inside a single chip. So one of the example for a microcontroller is in 8051, which Intel have uh, first commercial success have found in 8051 microcontrollers. A lot of gadgets in the world has been developed using 8051 microcontroller. So this is a typical uh, diagram of an Intel 8051 microcontroller. So what they have put is they have put the CPU inside, that is a, the microprocessor itself inside the chip. And then they put about four kilobytes of uh, program memory, 128 bytes of RAM, two timers they have put it and some ports to connect to the external world and some port to connect to the external computers on other uh, devices like an internet device, internet uh, communication for other purposes. They are provided with serial port. That means that typically the 8051, which is a popular Intel microcontroller at those times, so they had able to put the memory, they able to put the ports inside a single chip along with the CPU. So that is how the microcontrollers are being designed. So in a single shot, the microprocessor do not contain the RAM and the ports inside the chip. Whereas a microcontroller contains the ports and the memory inside the same chip where the CPU is residing. So let's understand the differences, uh, typically about five to six differences. Let's study that. Is the slide changed? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, these are the, I have listed few of the differences. So as we know that whenever, whenever you build a microprocessor system, CPU is, uh, is alone uh, and you can decide how much of memory and uh, the ports are required. So that uh, typically there is a freedom is there on the development developer of a computer to put how much of memory required. You have seen that, correct? No? When you purchase a computer, beginning you had a less RAM is there. Whenever you feel that you want to run a very, very low, very uh, compute intensive application, you would have added later the more RAM for that. That means that, so there is a, there is a scope for expansion of the system, which is not present in a microcontroller based applications or systems. So generally when you purchase a computer, we know that we have to spend around 30 to 40,000 rupees, unlike in a microcontroller based system, which is only cost about 500 to 1000 rupees. If you go for Arduino microcontroller, you pay only 30, 300 to 400 rupees to get the board. Whereas normal computers are very expensive. Versatility in the sense, when you purchase a laptop, it was not designed that is you're going to do only this job. In the first semester, your tasks were different. When you reach the seventh semester, the tasks will be different. Or when you, after graduation, you may use the computer for something else. It's a versatile. Whereas here, it's all single purpose. When you purchase a microcontroller-based system, for example, you purchase a washing machine, the task of the computer present inside has been predefined. It's for one job you're going to use that one. So. It, it is versatile and general purpose in the sense the flexibility is more and it used for a variety of applications. So it's a high processing power. So normally since you pay more and there is a separate CPU is there and there is a fan is also there which is fitted on the, the Intel process, whatever you use in your computers, it can able to run at very high speeds so that computation is very high. They use a Cisco architecture that makes it more powerful compared to the, the process which has been manufactured. Controllers have been manufactured using a RISC architecture their capability is also less, uh, their capability is also less. So one of the disadvantages of the microprocessor based systems is high power consumption because it's a compute intensive and the large uh, number of ports and the memory is present, the power consumption is more. Whereas here everything is put in a single chip, the power consumption is less here. So there's a Cisco architecture, these are all, so what is called as a RISC architecture. And also as we have studied in microcontrollers like an ARM microcontroller, ARM core, if there are instructions are there to do the bit level manipulation. Here we don't much focus on the bit level manipulations. Here bit level support for bit level processing is a little less here. Typically the microprocessor what you use in the laptops nowadays are 64 bit in nature. Whereas even today the 6 bit or 16 bit or 8 bit microcontrollers are available in the market for many number of applications. So typically deep, deep pipeline will be there. Number of stages in the pipeline is more to make it more uh, throughput, increase the throughput. For example, 5 to 20 stages are there, whereas typically here, here a single or two stage, as we have seen in the ARM 7, we had a three stage pipeline was there. So these are the few differences. You can list out at least six to seven differences between a microprocessor and a microcontroller. So generally keep in mind that controllers, the moment controller comes into picture, it's a low power, the low cost and the size, it's battery operated systems. Whereas the moment the microprocessor comes into picture, it operates an external power supply. It has got a variety of applications. So there is no restriction on for what application you're going to run. So let's move to the further classifications. So what are the characteristics of embedded systems? So now 
I, my focus is on microcontroller based systems. Any system which has been designed and which has been manufactured with a microcontroller inside, we call as an embedded system. We call as an embedded system. What are the characteristics of an embedded systems? These are some of the characteristics of an embedded systems. It requires low power in the sense it can operate from a battery. It starts from 300 rupees, 400 rupees. You can get an embedded systems. It is a task specific meant for a particular specific applications. It's a time specific in the sense if you start, for example, you want to wash, you want to finish the washing of a class within 20 minutes, which has been defined. It's, it's make sure that it completes the operation within that time. Unlike a normal computer, when you when you just submit a certain job of programming, it takes its own time. You, it's not a uh, predictable time is not predictable. So minimal user interface. So unlike a computer where you have a variety of interfaces, starting from keyboard, mouse, the touch, everything. Whereas the embedded system will provide a minimal user interface, sometimes some keys, sometimes some knobs, sometimes some LCD, the minimal interfaces are provided. High efficiency, since uh, the systems are efficient and reliable. So in the sense, so it is supposed to uh, perform the same job repeatedly, many number of times over the period of years. You cannot say that it's reliable for a first year or second year after that it's not reliable, no. So you expect a high efficient and reliability from this system. So highly stable, generally embedded systems are being deployed at very remote places where the human intervention is very less. For example, you're deploying a sensor in a, uh, in a field, agricultural field. You want to expect the measure of the moisture in the agricultural field. So you expect it to be reliable, efficient, and also stable. So these are some of the characteristics which are highly required for embedded system where this much of uh, uh, expectation is not there in a normal computer system because even if it hangs, what do you do? You restart it, yes or no? And if you work for two hours, it gets heated. You switch off and leave for half an hour, again restart it. All these things are tolerable in a normal computing systems, whereas these are not tolerable in an embedded system. These are the few characteristics of embedded system. So these are some of the examples of embedded systems. Uh, There's characteristic, few of them. For example, embedded systems are created to perform at the task within a certain time frame. It must therefore perform a fast enough a car's brake system, if execute, if exceeds the time limit, may cause accidents. So that is a criticality of your response time of your embedded system. So these are the, some of the features has been listed there. Okay. Now, is the slide changed? I'm an un audible. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we will see what is the difference between a general purpose computer that is a normal laptop or a desktop computer on embedded system. So we have listed around uh, seven reasons here. You can list some more, some more things also. Let's study one by one. So as we already discussed, a system which is a combination of a general hardware and general purpose computer. So it's a variety of application. Applications are specified. Here in embedded system, you are executing a specific set of applications. Now, coming to OS, this is where the difference lies. A normal laptop or a desktop computer do not work without an OS. You require the Linux or Windows is a compulsory requirement. So you require general purpose operating system. Through that, you get the work done of your computer. You give an instruction to an OS. OS in turn gets the work done through your hardware and your task will be executed. In a normal embedded system, there's an option say that if you're thinking of a small size embedded system, you may not have an OS at all. For example, the programs what you written in assembly language earlier and the other units. So there was no OS is there. The moment you restart, your program is running. That means that you can develop most of your system without an OS. So in unit four and five and the small projects, what you're going to do as a part of this coursework, we don't use an operating system. We will generally run our programs directly in the controller without an OS. Same thing you did with an uh, Arduino also. So when you use an Arduino or Node MCO, you never use an operating system. But when you are micro, when your uh, embedded system is little complex, it's a medium size or uh, it's a complex, uh, op micro complex embedded system, then there is always a requirement of an operating system like a Linux, embedded Linux. So why it's required means you have to create number of tasks when the more number of tasks are there there should be an understanding among the tasks the order of execution there's an exchange of information between the tasks all those things are required it is difficult to manage by the programmer 
so difficult depends upon the difficulty you may use an operating system or may not use an operating system example of embedded operating systems or your embedded linux and mucos there are so many operating systems available nowadays to support your embedded systems applications are alterable programmable by the user it is possible for the end user to reinstall the os and also to add and remove the user application that means that there is a scope for you to extend the the functionality of computer by adding some more applications some more hardware everything is there that means that we can say it's alterable in the sense there is a scope for expansion the scope for extending the user the software is extending the hardware also here there is no scope is there once you purchase for example a refrigerator or a washing machine there is no way for you extend that is you can add another uh, software plugin for that or another hardware for that generally generally i'm talking the maybe the the new smart systems may have the provision to upgrade for example mobile phone, mobile phones as a facility to upgrade itself its os so such such facilities are nowadays they are introducing in the smart systems but in general terms generally when you purchase an embedded system so there is a there is a freeze you are freezing the expansion of both software and the hardware the key factor the performance is a key deciding factor in the selection of the system so faster is better that means that when you go for a laptop always your mind goes at how fast is it going to work how many megahertz the system is worth how much is our hard disk capacity what is the number of cores present in the cpu that means that when you buy a laptop the key constraints the key factors you think to take a decision is different the factors what you think when you purchase an embedded system is different you are looking what application specific requirements so no like the performance power requirements memory usage etc so generally including the money size and everything comes into picture here the size does not comes into picture so and the faster is better so the size and the uh, how fast it works size is the matter here how fast it works is a matter in case of a general purpose computer so there are certain factors are there so which are different when you select a general purpose system and a normal embedded system power consumption you never worry when you purchase a laptop you never ask the question to an a shopkeeper how much is the power consumption how much is power bill have you thought about it no no way you thought about the power whereas when you purchase an embedded system particularly if it is a battery operated system we ask the question how once if i charge how long it works for example if you deploy a sensor the iot sensor a smart sensor in a agricultural field my first question is that how long this can stay without recharging so if i am able to leave the sensor there one month without recharging without replacing a battery then it's a preferable that means that the power consumption matters in a embedded system it does not matter much in the general purpose computers the response time it's not critical when you run an application you take you allow the time to respond so for example when i start want to the browse certain things time is not critical i say just it's fast is good enough but i am not critical about the time does it complete in seconds milliseconds like that here are critical for some apple applications as i said when you use a boiler so when the boiler temperature exceeds 100 degree it has to automatically shut down off so there there is no time is there if you if you shut off the boiler after 10 seconds then what will happen the catastrophe can leads so that mean that it is in your hands to design the system that it should able to respond within the particular time limit so this is very critical in case of an embedded system it is not so much critical in case of a general purpose computing systems execution need not be deterministic as i was telling that so the time it takes to execute it's not that much deterministic here it should be deterministic one of the the best differences you can always give between the embedded systems and the general purpose computer system is deterministic behavior of an embedded system so there are many embedded systems are there you have to be determine you determine you should be deterministic you should be able to complete within the time specified based on based upon how much deterministic it is so we also called as a hard real time system or a soft real system system the systems where it has to be completed within the given time it's a hard real system some in some system where it is okay that mean that it can able to take little more time it can be tolerated such an applications or such an embedded system is called as a soft real system real time systems so these are the few of the factors so which differentiates a normal laptops and an embedded systems so the factors we consider is for what purpose we used the necessity of os is it an expandable system what are the factors we choose when we select an embedded systems uh, is the power consumption and the response times are important so these are the factors based on that we classify general purpose computing system and embedded system now let's go for the classification of embedded system so we have understood controllers microcontrollers are used in embedded systems we have also understood that the characteristics of embedded systems so understood that embedded systems are 
different from a normal your general purpose computers. Now let's go into little more details about embedded systems. So the moment I encounter any embedded system in my life, maybe in, in the family, maybe in your house, maybe in the places where you visit, now onwards, you put a question. How do I classify embedded system? There are two ways you can able to classify them. One is based on the performance and functional requirements. You can call it a real time, standalone, network embedded system, mobile. There's another way we classify this is a, a normal we use for a, uh, our coursework now. We classify them as into small scale, medium scale, and sophisticated systems. Some of the examples are given here. For example, real time embedded systems are traffic control systems, military usage in a defense sector medical usage in a health sector standalone embedded systems some of the examples are mp3 players microwave ovens and calculator uh, networked embedded systems home security systems atm machine cards swipe machine mobile embedded systems mp3 player mobile phones and digital camera these are the uh, some of the examples of these four types of embedded system now looking at small scale when i say small scale it is nothing but the lower capable microcontrollers are used in the small scale for example 8 bit microcontrollers is good enough here in a medium scale you may use 16 bit to 32 bit microcontrollers in the sophisticated you may use 32 bit microcontroller or onwards so 32 bit to 64 bit microcontrollers that means that classification of these systems are based on the what capacity of microcontrollers you are going to use it and also the cost here in a very small scale microcontroller the size is small and also the investment on the, on the systems is very less. So the cost, the microcontroller and the power consumption and the complexity of usage or complexity and application defines these three classification. For example, if you say ATM machine, ATM machine is a sophisticated embedded system. If you use MP3 player, MP3 player is, you can put them into the, the medium scale embedded system. If you use a digital camera, that is also you can put into either media scale or the sophisticated system. So, if you use a normal calculator, I can call this as a small scale embedded system. So based on the complexity, based on the type of microcontroller, based on the power consumption and the power usage, you can put them all this into either a small scale, medium scale and sophisticated embedded systems. Now, so once we have understood that uh, uh, microcontrollers are used, so people generally ask, how does microcontrollers core, the, what used in a microcontroller's core, that CPU core, is different from the core which is used in a microprocessor. So generally, as we have discussed in unit two, the RISC architecture has been used to manufacture the microcontroller, uh, the CPU cores. The CISC architecture has been used to manufacture the microprocessor cores. So as we already know that the number of instructions are, uh, 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 so here you can just replace this and not a few instructions. So many complex instructions are available here. The registers are less here and more microprogramming in the sense what, since the complex instructions are there, each instruction is nothing but what one microprogram corresponds to one instruction will be there. So n cycles per instruction, since the complexity is more, you have to fetch a lot of data from memory and then process and complete it. So you require a more number of clock cycles to complete it. It's a hardware focused, it's a uh, software focused. I don't, what is the meaning of that? I've added it anyway. So we'll see later. So this is a one cycle it takes per instruction. This is a more complex uh, uh, compilers and the compilers has to do more job here and the more registers are there. You can add a few more things uh, for this list of differences for the CISC and RISC architecture. So, so this completes, this completes about the introduction to the microcontrollers. So the embedded systems and the classification of embedded systems. So now let's understand we start with the unit four now so with one microcontroller in particular and we will study them in detail now i'm adable yes sir Okay, so now we will study today about a microcontroller. So we have understood the embedded systems, the basic, uh, could you see the PPT? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Today we have understood uh, what is an embedded system, 
what is the important component in embedded system so today we will understand one microcontroller which is extensively used in building embedded systems so which is that microcontroller so we will going to use arm microcontroller as already know that so arm microcontrollers will have the arm core supplied by the arm corporation so the remaining other peripherals the memory the ports which is surrounded by the arm core will be supplied will be will be decided and used by the manufacturer of the microcontroller and they put together all those things and manufacture and call this a microcontroller so now we are going to study one microcontroller which has been which is called as a arm microcontroller if i don't call the arm microcontroller what is the difference the only difference is generally the core and the memory and the ports are been manufactured by manufactured and designed by the same company so what is the what is the difference between a microcontroller and arm microcontroller in a normal microcontroller you have the cpu the memory the ports and the other peripheral supporting components are present inside a single chip that is called as a microcontroller we have understood that so what is our microcontroller our microcontroller is like a normal microcontroller only thing is the cpu core is being purchased or procured the rights for that the license the the ip rights for that has been taken by they can taken by the manufacturers of the chip from the arm company and then that is called as a arm microcontroller that's all the difference if i say intel 8051 microcontroller what does it mean that that mean that cpu core the ports memory everything has been designed and manufactured by intel company so if i say now arm microcontroller that mean that it's manufactured by some other company but the core is being supplied by arm company so with that uh, understanding we will start working with the arm microcontroller now so which is a microcontroller i am going to use now so i am going to use a microcontroller i am going to use a microcontroller uh, which is uses a core called arm 70d mis that we have studied in the in the uh, unit 1 2 3 so arm 70d mis is arm 7 version core so t refers to the thumb instruction set debugger it has got it has got a fast multiplier it supports debugging using ais and it's a synthesizable so we are now now going to use a, a microcontroller manufactured by lpc company lpc that is in the sense nxp semiconductor so nsp semiconductors is an offshoot of philips semiconductor earlier they called as a philips semiconductor the later they diversified in the semiconductor division they are calling as a nxp semiconductors nxp semiconductors manufactures a variety of arm microcontrollers starting from arm 7 arm 9 arm 11 so many variations of microcontrollers are supported by nxp uh, semiconductors so we are taking one microcontroller from nxp which was very popular in the earlier days so before the arm other versions came into the market arm 9 arm 10 11 arm 7 was very popular even today number of products even today number of products are been designed using the arm 7 core based microcontrollers so one such microcontroller which uses arm 7 core to manufacture as microcontroller is lpc2148 so lpc2148 has got a different variations in the same family like 2144 Two one four six and two one four eight. What is the difference? The difference is very small. Maybe the amount of memory, maybe the difference like that. Only few components inside is a variation. But otherwise, all this LPC family two one four X we call it two one four X. X means what? Two one four four or two one four six or two one four eight? LPC two one four X family will have the same size of the chip, same pin numbers will be there, and same number of pins will be there. That is it's common. So like this, for example, LPC seventeen six eight or seventeen. 6x family is there so where there are certain variations are there in the chip but variations in the memory but if you take the take the chip size and the number of pins and the meaning of the pins it will be same thing so tomorrow if you have designed the system using 2144 i can i can replace 2144 i can go for 2148 chip also so that mean that so depends upon the requirement if you have a customers three customers are there or three products are there for one product you require less memory you can go for 2144 for a particular product You require a little more memory and more features are required. You can go for two one four eight. So that means that much of the design will not change in the hardware. Yes or no? Only based on the the money it can generate or the what price I am going to 
uh, release my product you will be choosing one of the member in the family so generally if you take any family there are at least few variations are there in the same family so what is the difference between these few members only difference is what capabilities in a sense memory capability and some of the the ports or the some of the timers or the some of the facilities inside the chip will be different that's all so based on the the product line and how much it fetches the money you take a decision which member of that family you're going to use it so now we'll be studying about 2148 family or 214x family so this is a very popular family as i said number of products even today they use this uh, microcontrollers even though it is becoming outdated nowadays people are started using lpc next family called lpc 1768 but the knowledge what you get after or under knowledge what you get when you build a system using lpc 214x i'll tell you this knowledge will help you to design any other next version of or microcontroller families itself because why the concept the the way you program the different ports the different blocks inside the way you use the different features of this family will this understanding will enable you to understand better when you go for a higher family so if i started if i would have started my session with the 1768 itself is very difficult because at least 30 40 different blocks are there inside it is very difficult to understand and program it that is why generally what we do is in academic institutions we start with a, a lower capable microcontrollers so that we can appreciate the architecture what is present inside the meaning of different registers how do you use the different blocks how do you use the ports how do you use the timers the pwm blocks i2c block like that so that is why so understanding a smaller architecture gives a lot of strength to you and it gives a lot of confidence in you so that you can able to apply that knowledge when you work on the higher end microcontrollers don't think that so it's outdated what is the meaning of studying this one no you should not think in the microcontroller architectures like that because lower end architectures and lower end systems will enable your understanding in a better way so later you can switch to other microcontrollers very easily so that is why we have chosen lpc2148 which is this this microcontroller has been as a reference uh, in many of the studies throughout the world so if they study microcontroller based systems throughout the world any university take it so generally they prefer our arm 7 lpc2148 for the study because you can understand all the facilities of any microcontroller can offer for you am i audible yes sir okay so now we will dive into this chip so till now our focus was there our focus was only on the core which is used inside a microcontroller now my focus is what i will be diving deep into this microcontroller when i say dive deep i'll cut this use all the blocks what is present in that i'll be able to use all the pins what has been you were able to see that so in the next few sessions we will be able to understand every pin what is the meaning of it what is present inside the chip what is the function of it how do you use that one can i build my own small calculator using this microcontroller can i build my own washing machine using this microcontroller yes you can do it till now you are using the ready boards being supplied by the arduino or node mcu like that your focus was not on microcontroller your focus on building a product using the board now my focus is what not building the product using a controller till now your focus was what building an embedded product using the general purpose boards like an arduino or pi like that now what is my focus building the embedded system using the controller not using the board that mean that you have a complete freedom who knows tomorrow you can have your own type of boards released in the market which which can beat an arduino boards so the people who developed arduino were were like that kind of students so they were able to use a microcontroller and build a boards which can be useful to many, many people same thing if you look at this history the story behind the arpai that is how they have taken a microprocessor microprocessor or a system and chip they have built the board and make it popular similarly you can also think about and uh, making your own board we customized board you can release to the market and make it popular so that is why when we learn about a microcontroller you will get a confidence that you can build your own system on your own you can take a decision how my system board should look what are the facilities you should have it so what all the things i should be able to include it because when you develop any product smart system it is the hardware which matters i tell you soft hardware matters so much because why the reliability the the efficiency of your system and how rugged your system is all depends upon your hardware if you take a board which is not reliable which is not efficient which is not uh, power conservative your system is going to fail for example i cannot use an arduino rpi and put into commercial applications because they are not for a uh, military grade equipment they are not military grade they are consumer grade so it may it, it may it may good enough for the laboratory experiment it is not good enough for a deployment in the in, in the fields 
So that is why learning an LPG 2148, it's it's an industry grade and a military grade microcontrollers. That means any board you design using this microcontroller, you can convert them into an industrial product or commercial product. Now, so now be ready to go in detail into dive into this microcontrollers. So next probably four to five sessions or 10 classes, we will understand each and every part of this microcontroller and get the confidence that I can build my system on my own, just investing thousand to 2000 rupees. So this is the chip. You can look at this. So the four sites are there. The, the chips what you used in the third semester when you've done a digital lab was a two sites were there. They were called the dual inline package. It's a dual inline package. Those chips are two sites. The pins are located here. The pins are located on the four sites. That's why you call it quad package. Quad. Quad means four sites are there. So which is a pin number one? There's a small notation is available. Circle here. From there, the pin number counts here. If you look at the pin number, how many pins are there? So there are 64 pins. If somebody asks, how many pins are there? LPC2148. This is the first thing you have to remember by the end of the today. I am using LPC2148. It's an ARM 7 core based microcontroller. It has got a 64 pins. It's a quad package. This is the first thing you have to remember it. So now, so what are the uh, what are the facilities this quad package it provides? So this the microcontroller LPC2148. So it's it as I said, it uses. Uh, So it uses ARM 7 2 dimas A7 core as we discussed. So it is used for following application, number of products available in the industry. They use for industrial control, medical systems, access control, like your door locking, other things you can able to implement, point of sale, that is buying missions. Each and every division here can be your project, self city project. It's used in industrial control to control the missions. It's used medical system to design a uh, biomedical analyzer. So uh, for a blood testing and other things, you can use it. Used for access control like uh, uh, door lock systems. It's a point of sale. Weighing machines you can manufacture using this one. It's a communication gateway that you can use this as a gateway to collect the data from the sensors and push into the uh, your uh, uh, internet uh, network. It's a protocol converters. You can convert from one protocol that is a UART protocol to USB, like converting I2C to some other protocol. You can able to do that. Embedded soft modem, voice recognition, low end imaging. Even you can connect a serial camera and capture the images and you can get to do a small decisions based on the image and you can able to act so and the general purpose applications so these are the few six to seven applications which has been uh, extensively for these application that lpc2148 has been used now so now we will go into the details about this chip this is what is present inside the chip now so now what is that is the slides are changing hello are the slides yes, changing? Sir. Yeah. So look at this. This is the chip what I'm talking about. Now I'm going into, I'm just opening the chip and seeing what is present. This is what is present inside the chip. So we will study in the, what is present inside the chip in step by step. Don't get confused. There are so many blocks there. How do I remember? How do you write it? No, it's not at all. It's easy to remember if you understand the functionality. First, number one, what is the thing I have to notice? It uses a CPU core. So what is the first block of any microcontroller? CPU. So which is a CPU used inside the LPC2148? ARM 7 TDMI S is a core is being used. So we know that ARM 7 TDMI core has the capability of JTAG support. It provides a JTAG interface. That is one of the feature of a ARM microcontroller. This is the JTAG interface. So ARM 7 TDMI core provides a JTAG interface. These are the pins related to JTAG. So what is these pins? Using these pins, I can debug my microcontroller based hardware, stop the program in between and see what is happening in the hardware. So this is for a JTAG interface. This is the code now used. This is an emulation trace model. I insert cute emulator, what is a 7 TDMI, yes, no? That is a facility, it's called. So this is a bridge. We will talk about the bridge later. So the first block we identified is what? LPC214 contains ARM CPU. So version number is ARM 7 TDMI. Yes, it provides a JTAG interface. So LPC214 in a, Chip provide a JTAG interface so that I can I can debug embedded systems based on LPC2148. So it is this type of JTAG interface is not provided in normal microcontrollers like your Arduino or your Intel 8051 microcontrollers. This is provided generally in a advanced microcontrollers like ARM microcontrollers. Now, now we'll go to the second block now. Any microcontroller you take it, any microcontroller you take it, basically it runs at a particular speed. To make the microcontroller run at a particular speed, 
we use a typical component in our electronic system we call it as a crystal any crystal if you go and purchase in the market go to the sp road and ask give me a crystal so he will give a component which has got a two leads which has a two leads so that crystal you have to connect to this point that means that so the crystal is a is a inductor capacitor component it's a component which is capable of deciding the speed at which your microcontroller works so crystals when you purchase a crystal they will ask you the question when you go to the market and ask give me a crystal they will ask you what is the frequency at what the crystal required they say that do you want 11.059 megahertz do you require a 12 megahertz crystal do you require a 24 megahertz crystal they will ask generally for default for most of the common lpc 244 based system uses 12 megahertz crystal no one would have asked a question what is lpc 148 crystal which is used with the lpc 248 you should say 12 megahertz 12 megahertz is a crystal very popularly used in the 248 system you can use a lesser value also but most commonly i'm talking about most commonly the 12 megahertz crystal is being used to drive this lpc 248 so when i connect a 12 megahertz crystal that mean that this crystal decides the speed at which your system work so crystal is used to generate what is called as a clock so clock is what it's nothing but a square wave form or maybe uh, uh, with a different duty cycle may not be exactly square it's different duty cycle also so it's a square wave form so which has got a particular frequency if i say this is a one clock period so one clock is this is the period one clock is this period so this decides what is the speed of the system at which it works so what is the frequency of uh, uh, your uh, your wave form that depends upon the clock period so if i say what is the frequency of this is nothing but is what if i say 12 megahertz my t is what t is equal to so 1 by the frequency of that 1 by whatever the frequency you have it so if it 12 megahertz is a crystal you are connecting the one time period is nothing but what t is equal to 1 by 12 megahertz now so now we have understood that the more the value of a crystal value the more the speed at which it work you know that the latest microprocessor will work at what 100 megahertz 120 megahertz 200 megahertz 300 megahertz like that so it's always better to have a higher value of crystal so that your system's throughput that mean that it is able to complete the task within a given time for example so if i say that one instruction is sufficient to complete one one cycle one clock cycle is sufficient to complete one instruction we know that arm 72 device is capable for that what is the actual time required to complete one instruction if my crystal is 12 megahertz if this is a question asked in the in the quiz what do you what is your answer so you know that one clock cycle is required for one instruction the frequency of a crystal is 12 megahertz then how do you calculate t is equal to 1 by 12 megahertz at use it whatever you get that is a microsecond that much is the time required for one instruction if i give four instruction i'll ask you what is the time required then what you have to do find out the t for one instruction t into 4 that is the time required for that so now onwards given the you know the crystal value you know the the crystal value you know the time taken for one instruction so if you know the what is the size of your program that is how many instructions are there you are in a position to decide what is the time required to complete a particular task so that much details we will be able to uh, uh, we will able to uh, manipulate or get the information so when you design the system using a microcontroller when you write a program in c language or java and everything using a normal computer you never worry about what is the time required to complete one particular job is yes or no you use the time function what is provided in the os and then say that this is the time required here i can dictate so when i develop my algorithms when i develop my product i am very sure that this task is going to complete within this time because why i know the frequency at which to, my board is going to work because i know the information both at the hardware level and the software level normally when you develop programs you will be knowing only at the software side that is your logics you are not knowing about on which system it's going to work that is why it is not a deterministic you are don't have a control over the timings whereas here it is deterministic because you have designed both the hardware you have designed the both the software so you have the control say that yes this is a deterministic it's going to complete within particular time so that much confidence or the deterministic uh, you can able to decide when you design an embedded systems one of the reason is you know the crystal frequency at which works so generally what will happen inside the so inside these microcontrollers they use what is called as phase lock loop phase lock loop is an hardware logic or electronics technology which is used inside the microcontroller to enhance the clock speed if i am connecting at 12 megahertz here using the pl phase lock loop hardware i can enhance that clock speed 
from 12 megahertz to 60 megahertz. That means I can multiply. So there is a, a registers are provided inside here. It's a program register. By configuring the register, I can multiply the frequency available from the clock so that I can enhance the clock frequency at which my core is going to work. So by default, generally, generally most of your projects, they have configured the PLL and the register such that they multiply this 12 megahertz into a factor such that it works at a 60 megahertz. So normally the CPU that is the ARM core runs at 60 megahertz, even though you supply at a 12 megahertz. So what is the technology they've used? Phase lock loop is a technology used to enhance the crystal frequency from 12 megahertz to 60 megahertz. So now one would have asked you the question, what is generally the ARM core of LPC2144 right works or what speed it works? Your answer should be what? 60 megahertz, even though you are using it 12 megahertz. Now, so this clock, which is being generated from the PLL0, two PLLs are there. One PLL is used to generate the clock for the CPU core. Another PLL is used to generate the clock for USB logic. So let's not worry about the USB logic. So the clock which is generated by the PLL is popularly called a C clock or it's called a CPU clock. So we use a word called as number one, C clock. So C clock is the name of the clock used to drive the your core. So if I say C clock is 60 megahertz, that does not, that what does it mean that? That means that all the instructions in the core will run at what speed? 60 megahertz speed. So if you ask me what is a clock cycle for one instruction, what is the time taken for one instruction? I have to say, have to say what? T is equal to 1 by 60 megahertz. So summarizing, crystal 1 and crystal 2 are the two pins provided for the LPC21, LPC2148 chip where I'm connecting a 12 megahertz crystal. Use it in a hardware called phase lock loop. I'll enhance this speed of this crystal frequency to what is called as uh, 60 megahertz. So now onwards, the system clock or the CPU clock will be nothing but the clock supplied by the PLL0. The frequency at which the crystal is being supplying the frequency, the, the crystal decides the frequency, you know, that frequency we call it FOSC. So FOSC is the word or the symbol we use it to decide the, the clock decided by the crystal frequency, FOSC. That means that, so frequency of an oscillator. So this is 12 megahertz, this is a 60 megahertz. Generally, the systems have been designed like that. If you disable the PLL, you don't want the PLL zero. You don't want to work at 60 megahertz, then disable the PLL. By default, the PLLs are disabled unless you enable them in the program. So if the PLL zero is disabled, then what is your C clock? C clock is nothing but what? FOSC. FOSC is nothing but what? The frequency of your crystal. The frequency of the crystal is 12 megahertz. So if the PLL zero is disabled, your C clock is nothing but FOSC, which is nothing but 12 megahertz. So just remember that LPC2148 is capable of working at 12 megahertz to 60 megahertz. It depends upon the decision of the hardware engineer, the software engineer, whether they want to work at 60 megahertz or at a 12 megahertz. So this completes today's session about this one. So we will continue working on this one in the next classes. So if you have any doubt, you can just raise your doubts.